Well, hello, Avenue, and welcome to a new sermon series on our YouTube channel. We're beginning a new series today, looking at the letter of 1 Peter in the New Testament. And I'm really excited to hear what the Lord is going to be teaching us through this letter. It's a fairly short one, just five chapters in our Bibles, but there is so much of the beauty and life-changing power of the gospel in it. It really is one of the treasures of the Bible. And in the weeks to come, as we walk our way through 1 Peter, we're going to discover that this letter has the power to change lives. And where does that power come from? Well, it comes from the life-changing power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What Peter calls at the very end of his letter in 1 Peter 5 verse 12, the true grace of God. See, according to Peter, the gospel, the message about Jesus Christ, is all about the astonishing grace of God towards us in Christ. And Peter's convinced of something. No one can encounter the true grace of God in Jesus without their lives being changed as a result. So what is the message of 1 Peter for us today? Well, we're going to see Peter returning to some key themes again and again in the coming weeks. See, according to Peter, thanks to the true grace of God in the gospel, we have hope in the midst of suffering. We have hope in the midst of suffering. See, this letter is full of practical encouragement for suffering Christians to help us keep trusting in Jesus, even when times are hard. Another part of the message of 1 Peter is that we are a pilgrim people and our future home is glorious. Peter describes the believers he's writing to as foreigners and exiles in this world. That's chapter 2 and verse 11. See, if you're a Christian watching this today, Peter wants you to remember something. This world is not your home. And as a result, every Christian will experience fairly severe bouts of homesickness from time to time. We'll experience feelings of frustration, of discontentment, of a deep longing for a better world. And we should all expect that, says Peter. But we can also know that thanks to Jesus saving death on the cross for us, you are now on your way home. And one day the Lord Jesus will welcome you into that far country where you truly, fully belong. A new creation free from sin and suffering and death, where you'll, do, where you'll live the life you were created to live. A life of worship and joy in the God of grace. That's a message we need to hear. It's a truth we need to be reminded of. We're a pilgrim people on our way home. And another truth that Peter wants us to grasp in this letter is this. The way we live today has the power to win over unbelievers. The way Christians live today has the power to win over unbelievers. So in chapter 3 of the letter, speaking to Christian wives married to non-Christian husbands, Peter urges them to live Christ-like lives in their marriages so their husbands may be won over by their way of life. Or a little earlier in chapter 2 and verse 12, writing to the whole church, Peter says this, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. That's chapter 2 and verse 12. See, 1 Peter's a great letter to encourage us in our evangelism, both as individuals and as a church family. And I'm excited to see what we're going to learn from this letter together in the coming weeks. Now, by way of an introduction to the letter, I want to begin this series by thinking a bit about the man who wrote the letter, the Apostle Peter. Now, we need to be clear, the letter of 1 Peter isn't really about Peter. It's about the true grace of God in the gospel. But, but pausing at the beginning of this series to look at Peter's life can help us see the power of the gospel that Peter is writing about. You see, as a church family at Avenue, we talk a lot about life-changing relationships with Jesus. Jesus. 
We believe that when someone puts their trust in Jesus, their lives are changed forever. And more than that, we believe that one of the main reasons why God gathers Christians into local churches like Avenue is so that God can go on changing us to make us more like Jesus as we live in loving relationship with him and with one another. So as a church, we're all about life-changing relationships with Jesus. But I'm aware that's a great sounding phrase, but what does that look like in practice? Well, as I've been looking at the letter of 1 Peter and preparing for this, I'm more and more convinced of something. The Apostle Peter is a great example of a life changed by Jesus, a life transformed by the true grace of God in Christ. You see, Peter was nearing the end of his life when he wrote this letter of 1 Peter. 1 Peter's probably written around AD 62 to 64 during the reign of Emperor Nero. Peter seems to be living in Rome when he's writing it. He's living alongside other Christians like Mark, the one who wrote the gospel bearing that name. And Peter would go on to be executed by Nero just a few years after writing this letter alongside huge numbers of other Christians round about the year AD 66. So Peter is nearing the end of his life, writing this letter around 30 years after Jesus' death, resurrection and ascension into heaven. So how does Peter describe himself at this stage in his life? Well, first of all, he describes himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. That's chapter 1. Verse 1, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Here Peter reminds his readers he was one of the 12 disciples or apostles of Jesus when Jesus was on earth. More than that, Peter was in Jesus' inner circle of friends alongside James and John. So Peter lived in close daily relationship with Jesus for three whole years, traveling with Jesus, eating with Jesus, speaking with Jesus, listening to Jesus. See, Peter was one of Jesus' closest friends. And we're going to see his friendship with Jesus transformed him completely. Another way Peter describes himself in this letter is he's a witness of Christ's sufferings. That's chapter 5, verse 1. A witness of Christ's sufferings. We're going to see throughout this letter in the coming weeks that Peter, he's writing to suffering Christians here. He's writing to Christians scattered across first century Turkey who are suffering for their faith in Jesus. Now, this doesn't seem to be the sort of state-sponsored persecution that was going to happen just a few years later under Emperor Nero. But these Christians are being mocked. They're being marginalised. They're being looked down upon by the people around them and the people ruling over them. In many ways, you could say they're suffering the same sort of low-level personal rejection that a lot of Christians suffer in our culture today. And what does Peter have to say to these suffering Christians? Well, interestingly, he doesn't pray for their suffering to end. And he doesn't show them the key to living a triumphant life free from suffering. He has a very different message for them. See, as you read over the letter of 1 Peter, Peter writes a huge amount about the sufferings of Christ in this letter. In fact, when Peter refers to Christ's saving work on the cross, he always refers to it as the sufferings of Christ rather than Christ dying for us. Why does he do this? Well, Peter wants us to see something. Christ's sufferings are the pattern for normal Christian living. Christ's sufferings are the pattern for the Christian life. Look at 1 Peter 4 for a minute, verses 12 to 13 as an example of this. Dear friends, says Peter, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Or 1 Peter 2 verse 21, to this you were called, says Peter, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his 
steps. See, Peter was a witness of Christ's suffering, firsthand and up close. He would have seen Jesus suffer throughout his earthly ministry. As he was wrongly accused by his enemies, as people hardened their hearts and turned away from him, as he was confronted with all the damage that sin and death has done to this world and to people in this world. Peter was there in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before the cross when Jesus said to him, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Peter would have seen Jesus praying that night. He would have seen Jesus sweating drops of blood as he prepared for the cross. And then Peter's description of the cross in chapter 2 and verse 23 bears all the hallmarks of an eyewitness. When they hurled their insults at Jesus, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Peter was a witness of Christ's sufferings. And how did that affect Peter? Well, it left Peter in no doubt of the true extent of Jesus' love for us. That Jesus was willing to endure such suffering to save us from our sin and bring us to God. But it also convinced Peter that a vital part of us following Jesus is suffering for Jesus. Peter tells us in this letter, we shouldn't be surprised by suffering when it comes. Instead, we can trust God's good purposes for us in any experience of suffering. And we can know that Jesus understands. He is with us. He's able to help us and even bless us as we suffer for him. So Peter describes himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ, as a witness of Christ's sufferings. And the final way Peter describes himself in this letter, the one I want to leave us with today is this. Peter sees himself as as a life transformed by the true grace of God. That's chapter 5, verse 12. A life transformed by the true grace of God. As I've been preparing for this series, I think one of the most precious things about the letter of 1 Peter is it shows us a life that has been utterly changed by knowing Jesus. It shows us how much the grace of God through Jesus can transform a foolish, proud, sinful man like Peter and how that same grace of God through Jesus can transform foolish, sinful, proud people like us if we go to Jesus. And the passage in this letter that I think maybe shows us most clearly how Peter had changed through knowing Jesus by the end of his life is 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 to 7. Let me read that for us now. All of you, says Peter, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God opposes the pride but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. See, in this passage, Peter shows himself to be a man saved by grace, but also a man humbled by grace. Now, our All Age Slot series this term will be looking at the life of Peter as it's recorded for us in the Gospels and in the Book of Acts. And before Peter met Jesus, well, famously, he's a fisherman. But from the Gospels, we also learn that, that Peter, he was strong minded. He was proud. He was self-confident. He was self-reliant. He could even be a bully at times. But when Jesus met Peter and called him to follow him, Jesus began a process of humbling Peter. It was a long, often painful process for Peter, but the result was a life that rejoiced in the true grace of God towards foolish people like Peter, and a life that longed to point other people to that true grace of God that could save them too and transform them too. See, one of the best summaries of the gospel I've heard over the years is this. We are more sinful than we ever imagined. And we are more loved 
than we ever dreamed. See, to truly put our trust in Jesus, to truly be transformed by the gospel, we need to accept the bad news of that first statement as well as the good news of the second statement. See, out of his great love for Peter, Jesus committed himself to exposing Peter's sin, to exposing Peter's foolishness and pride, all with the goal of helping Peter see just how desperately he needed God's grace. And when Peter came to realize that for himself, then Jesus also showed Peter how lavishly God showers his grace on everyone who humbles themselves and trusts in Jesus. See, the story of Peter is very much the story of a man being humbled by God's grace. And Peter's lifelong discovery of grace begins in the four Gospels when Peter spends three years following Jesus. And again, you read the Gospels. In the Gospels, Peter, he's often lied. He's often boastful. He's often self-reliant. But Jesus teaches Peter that instead, the life God calls on us to live is one of love and service. Jesus treats the people he meets, often marginalised people, with kindness and compassion. People Peter would otherwise just reject or ignore. Jesus teaches Peter about forgiveness, about prayer, about loving your enemies. And in perhaps the most powerful act of service Jesus ever does for Peter, he washes Peter's feet, to show him the sort of sacrificial love he has for his people, the sort of sacrificial love his followers should show to one another. And then at the cross, Peter discovers the depths of his sin. Famously, Peter boasts that he will always be faithful to Jesus. He will never let Jesus down. And then only hours later, when Jesus is arrested, Peter denies even knowing Jesus three times. Confronted with his sin and his failure, Peter breaks down and weeps. But while Peter is weeping, while Peter's overcome with his sin, Jesus still chooses to go to the cross to suffer and die to save Peter. So that at the resurrection, Peter discovers God's grace is greater than our sin. God's grace is greater than our sin. See, Jesus saw Peter clearly for who he was. Jesus knew in advance that Peter was going to deny knowing him three times. And yet Jesus still went to the cross for Peter. And when Jesus rose again from the dead three days later, he meets Peter on the beach. He makes breakfast for Peter. He forgives and welcomes Peter back into relationship with himself. It's an amazing picture of God's grace and it changes Peter. But we might think, well, okay, when at that point, surely Peter's learned all there is to learn. But no, The risen Jesus still has things to teach Peter about his grace. So in the book of Acts, Peter learns the gospel is actually for all nations. See, like the other Jewish disciples, Peter sort of struggles to believe that non-Jewish people can respond to the good news of Jesus without first becoming Jews themselves. But then in Acts chapter 10, the risen Lord Jesus gives Peter a vision of clean and unclean animals being lowered from heaven in a blanket to show Peter that God has no favoritism, that people from all nations can trust in Jesus in all that he has done for them at the cross. And Peter then begins to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. But again, we learn later in the New Testament, Peter still could get things wrong in following Jesus. So in the letter to the Galatians in chapter 2, Peter gets it wrong about eating with Gentiles. So Galatians chapter 2, the apostle Paul records for us how he had to challenge and rebuke Peter for his failure to eat with Gentiles. See, Peter still had things to learn about Jesus and about God's grace, even as a leader of the early church. And what does Peter's story teach us about the true grace of God? Well, I think it teaches us two things. We will always need God's grace and God is always gracious if we go 
to Jesus. We will always need God's grace and God is always gracious if we go to Jesus. It's so striking to me that Peter got things wrong again and again in his life. Peter never got beyond the point where he needed God's grace every single day. And I want to say to all of us, neither will we. We will always need God's grace, just like Peter did. And that means we can never boast or imagine we are better than other people. Remember Peter's words in chapter 5. God opposes the pride, but gives grace to the humble. That's a lesson Peter learnt the hard way, and he wants us to learn it too. See, we live in a confusing, often angry world today. And we are often confused and angry about it. And it can be all too easy to reject or mock or look down on the people we disagree with. But what would Peter say to us when we do that? I think he would say to us, remember the grace of God towards you in Jesus. You are not a good person. You are no better than anyone else. And your only hope and your greatest need is the grace of God. So let that truth humble you. Let that truth help you say no to anger, to self-righteousness, to looking down on the people you disagree with. See, Peter's life story tells us every single one of us is in need of God's grace every single day of our lives. So none of us can boast or imagine we're better than anyone else. The true grace of God humbles us. But Peter's life story also shows us that God is always gracious if we go to Jesus. Peter's words in 1 Peter 5, they're just so comforting for us. God opposes the pride, but he gives grace to the humble. That is a promise. If we humble ourselves, if we admit our need and go to Jesus to forgive us, God will always be gracious to us, just as he was to Peter. So you read over the Gospels, you discover an amazing truth about Jesus and Peter. Jesus saw Peter clearly. He saw who Peter really was. He saw all his pride and his foolishness and his weakness. He knew even beforehand just how much Peter would let Jesus down. And yet, Jesus still loved Peter. He still chose to suffer and die on a cross to save Peter and make him his own. And Peter in this letter wants us to see that God's grace is just as true for us as it was for him. Jesus sees each one of us clearly for who we really are in all our pride and foolishness and weakness. Jesus knows we are often faithless and yet he still chooses to love us. He still chose to go to a cross, to suffer and die, to bring us to God, to adopt us forever into God's family. So how should we respond to the true grace of God? Well, Peter tells us, In 1 Peter 5, the verses we looked at earlier, we should humble ourselves under God's mighty hand. We should thank God for his unfailing grace. We should worship him for never letting us go, even when we let go of him. And then we should go on depending on God for his grace every single day of our lives. Look at verse 7 for a minute here. Cast All your anxiety on him, says Peter. Why? Because he cares for you. Because God today is the same God of grace as he was for Peter 2,000 years ago. Because God today knows all about your weakness and your need and he still chooses to lavish his grace on us if we humble ourselves and ask him for it. See, we're going to start looking at the letter of 1 Peter properly next week. But for now, I want us to remember and rejoice in the grace God always demonstrated in Peter's life. For it's the same grace God wants to demonstrate in our lives.
Peter. He's an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's a witness of Christ's suffering. And he is a life transformed by the true grace of God. So let's remember as we listen to this great letter over the coming weeks, the God of grace who saved and humbled and transformed Peter is the same God of grace who can save and humble and transform us if we go to Jesus and ask him to save us. See, it's my hope and my prayer that spending time in this letter over the coming weeks will help us more rejoice in the grace of God that is ours in Jesus and it will encourage and equip us to proclaim that grace, to share that grace with others as we live for Jesus in this world. Let me just finish with Peter's prayer at the very end of 1 Peter. Peter prays this, And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Amen.